Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here on this rather cluttery and rainy set of days that we've got right now. Um, let's see, there's a few things going on. First, obviously, we have a council meeting next Sunday, and we've got admin services here at uh, 1 p.m. and at uh, uh, our Redeemer. They've got a dinner and a service. Uh, their dinner kind of s sort of starts getting underway around quarter after five. It's usually in full swing by about uh, quarter to six, and then they have a, a service at seven. And the, uh, the gals have a Christmas dinner on the 16th, that's this Friday, uh, with a kind of a hors d'oeuvres at uh, 5.30 and dinner at 6.30. So that's what's all going on this week. Uh, and the theme for today, of course, this is the third Sunday in heaven. We like the pink candle because it's the Sunday of joy. That relates to the psalm that was traditionally related to the third Sunday in Advent, which talks about rejoicing. So the sermon for today is called Existential Christianity, and it is how we deal with the deep uh, issues of our existence as God's people. So we're going to apply that to uh, we'll basically apply the gospel lesson to our lives and uh, hopefully have a good takeaway from that. And as we are getting then close to Christmas, we've got uh, Mary and Joseph up on the altar now and uh, we'll have baby Jesus by the evening of the 24th. Next week we'll uh, have the schedule for the week uh, before Christmas. Christmas falls on a Sunday this year, so we'll be having uh, three services the following week. One on Wednesday for our final Advent service, uh, one on Saturday night for Christmas Eve, and then one Sunday morning for Christmas Day. So we pray that the Lord blesses us all during worship today. As a reminder, we uh, skip the Gloria and Chelsea's and the Alleluia for Advent, so I'll be reading the intro, we'll be doing the Kyrie, we'll be moving on, and then doing the readings kind of all together as we have been doing. Uh, Lord's blessings be with you today as we begin with the first four verses of the opening hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
Consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only begotten Son to die for each and every one of you and for his sake. He forgives you all your sins. As I called an ordained servant of that same Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the days, for their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord God, I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. O God, from my youth, you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. We may have to just do it on our own, Pastor. Um, difficult. All right. Technical difficulties. Well, well, we'll continue with the salutation and the call to the day. The Lord be with you. And the Lord also be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we implore you to hear our prayers and to lighten the darkness of our hearts by your gracious visitation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday in Advent is from Isaiah chapter 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad, the desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. And then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water, and the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes, 
and the highway shall be there, and shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way, even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sign shall flee away. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from James chapter 5. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. This is the word of the Lord. Please, read it now. Please rise as we hear the words of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. When John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news to preach to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by them. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. In the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent taken by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept that he is Elijah, who is to come, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Together we confess the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on page 206. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, 
who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon's title is Existential Christianity. All of you have watched a ball game at some point in time, and all of you have rooted for your team to win. But what happens when the victory or defeat is in the context of a championship or determines the outcome of the season for that team? The stakes are high, so what 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 will you do? How will you feel? Well, in some ways, that becomes a defining moment for that team, whether or not they win that championship, whether or not they pull through in the clutch. In 1969, the amazing Mets did the improbable and won the World Series. In the 1999-2000 to 2000 NFL season, the Cinderella story of quarterback Kurt Warner and the St. Louis Rams, the greatest show on turf, captured many hearts. Yet losers of those big games might go through an existential crisis, if you will. They might question their existence, wondering who they really are as individuals and as a team. As with both the Mets and the Rams, a victory can become a fleeting comet of glory that passes back into the long, cold darkness of mediocrity. The word existentialism is loosely applied to a belief system that values the thoughts and feelings of a person, an individual, in terms of knowing what is true and what is right. Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard, or as we more commonly call him, Søren Kierkegaard in English, expressed his existentialist ideas in opposition to German philosopher Georg Hegel. And this is in the mid-19th century. Hegel developed a system of thought where the universal consciousness of a community, if the community guidelines, if you will, is an evolving truth based on the interaction of ideas. In English, we call this interaction a thesis, that is, your ideas that you start with, an antithesis, that is, an experience that, you, that makes you confront your ideas over against that experience. <coughs> and it's, it's a, cha a challenge to you in many ways. And then we have a synthesis, that is, a new set of ideas that result from that challenge. <coughs> Now, followers of Hegel, which include Karl Marx and communism, believe that there will become a, a time where uh, all of the oppositional ideas will be quashed, and uh, all contrary thoughts will be banished in favor of the greater good, the overarching community guidelines. That is their plan, and it has been their plan since the mid-19th century. Kierkegaard, however, believed that people are more than cogs in the machine. They are more than something that exists for the community guidelines, the greater good. And so that he believed that there is something special and unique about you as a person. Yet, Kierkegaard, or at least his father, has taken things in a, a very psychological direction that uh, entangles ethics with personal feelings, so that you, in a way, become the most important person in the world to you. Uh, that also has its problems. Existentialism became very big in theology in the middle 20th century. You know, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was full of language that combines the appreciation of yourself as an individual and that becomes the gateway for your appreciation of others as equal individuals to you. It is no surprise that Fred Rogers was a Presbyterian minister. 
uh, Lutheran ministers in that period of time from the 1940s to the 1970s also included a lot of Kierkegaard in their thinking and in their sermons. And, you know, this sounds okay in the fact that it does get you to look out for other people and love them as your neighbor. However, uh, while uh, Hegel denies both God and man in favor of this kind of corporate satanic set of ruling ideas, uh, Kierkegaard leads one to embrace your own feelings if you want to find God. Now, the problem is that historic Christianity rejects both of these poles, these opposites, these, these extremes on a spectrum, if you will. Neither the corporate good is God, nor is the individual feeling God. Scripture gets to the original meaning, in fact, of an existential crisis, because all human beings are sinful, and the soul that sins shall surely die. So such a crisis, such an existential crisis, involves your very existence. Are you alive or are you dead? Will you live or will you die? In the Gospel lesson, John the Baptist was in prison. John knew that he would probably die fairly soon. He sent some disciples to ask Jesus if he were, in fact, the promised Messiah, the one who would establish God's kingdom on earth. And John was scared of dying. He was in the midst of an existential crisis. However, Jesus did not respond to John's question in the way that he might have expected or wanted. He did not uh, prom promise that John would be let out of jail free through a glorious revolution. Jesus said, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive the, their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. And so here he kind of gives John the subtle hint, the dead are raised up. Consider your existential crisis in light of that. Jesus then elaborates on his words after John's disciples leave. He praises John as the greatest prophet of God to date. The second Elijah who would precede the kingdom of God and the restoration of Zion. However, it was not going to happen like a lot of people expected. Yet John was still in prison. He was going to die. Blessed people do not die. They live. And yet here, Jesus is calling John blessed. Blessed people do not lose everything they have in abundance. And yet... Jesus is calling John blessed. John's ideas had not changed the community around him, and John's feelings were not going to stop the man with the big axe from taking his head. Neither Hegel nor Kierkegaard could offer John any hope here. But then comes Jesus. The text of John 11, verses 23 to 27, has a more severe existential crisis than that of our gospel text. Jesus said to Martha, Your brother Lazarus will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again on the resurrection on the last day. And of course, Martha gives the Sunday school answer that we would all expect at that time, you know, as we call it. And Jesus turns to her and very personally says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God who is coming into the world. Imagine that moment. I am the resurrection of life. He said that up close and personal. Every time we go to the Lord's Supper, Jesus says the same thing to us. I 
and the resurrection and the life. That's why we talk about the saints and angels and all the company of heaven in that context. Both Martha and John spoke concerning the Christ. He is more than a divine general who takes life. He is God who gives eternal life. The community consciousness could not raise Lazarus. The feelings of grief that Mary and Martha had could not bring their brother back from the grave. In fact, Jesus himself acknowledged the death of Lazarus. Jesus wept like they do in ancient times. He's not just sniffling a little bit. He's not just dabbing his nose with his hanky. He is wailing at the top of his lungs, shedding tears, rending his garments. He wept from, the, from deep in his guts, from the very core of his being for the death of his dear friend. So that even the community was astonished and amazed at the love that Jesus had for Lazarus. Yet Jesus' clear words go even beyond that grief and beyond those community expectations. They go beyond Hegel and Kierkegaard. They rise above this miasma of feelings, of community ideas, of grief, of loss, of all this stuff going on. And Jesus speaks very clearly in John 11, verse 43, above the din. He says, Lazarus, come out! Lazarus was dead, but now he's alive. When Jesus calls you from your grave, you too will awaken from death. Jesus' words utterly confirm your existence, either as one of his people in his eternal Zion, or as one condemned to the lake of fire for all eternity. The word of God is the first word, and it is the last word. For years, we Americans have put little stock in words. I remember a time back in the 1970s when the secular retail community uh, didn't really bother about Christmas until after Thanksgiving. Crazy, isn't that? As a matter of fact, the first Black Friday rush did not happen until 1983 when the Cabbage Patch Kids came out. And then all the retailers said, ah, we got to do that again next year. And it became a thing. Since then, retailers have been pushing secularized Christmas back even before Halloween. Heck, it can be August and you start seeing Christmas trees go up in some of these stores. And that means the word Christmas seems to have lost its meaning. Amid such empty jingles, vapid lyrics of canned Christmas music, and the drama of decorating and family gatherings, do we still hear the clear voice of Jesus that issued both from the babe in the manger and from the bloody man on the cross who said, Father, forgive them, Luke 23, verse 34. Do we look for Santa Claus to solve our existential crisis or do we look to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, in places in the world, there's a lot of existential crises going on. We often will point to Muslim countries as places where Christians face crisis. We often might point to East Asia as Christians where it might be in a mind. But even so, today in the Ukraine, millions of Christians will not be able to celebrate Christmas as they have in years past. The Ukrainian government, which is funded by our government, has sacked and ruined the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. It's a thousand-year-old church. <coughs> Where will God's people receive the holy body and blood of our Lord this Christmas if their priests, their bishops, their churches, and their monasteries are gone, ruined, ransacked, and taken into custody? Of course, something like that already has happened in this country. During the First World War, President Woodrow Wilson imprisoned thousands of Mennonites and Amish people for following the pacifist beliefs of their faiths. 
During the Second World War, President Franklin D. Roosevelt ordered thousands of Japanese American citizens to spend not only Christmas, but the rest of the year in internment camps through the duration of the war. If our government can do these things, can we take church for granted? Can we think that it's just always going to be here? In the face of that existential crisis, and in the face of our own mortality, both we and our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine have the comfort of our Savior's clear words, I am the resurrection and the life. John the Baptist did not deny the Lord. He faced his existential crisis. And though he died, yet he lives in Christ and awaits the new heavenly Zion, the way for which he prepared. Christians in ancient Rome did not bow their heads to the community standards of the dead. They faced the lions, the gladiators, torture, and mortal peril. They receive the crown of life and await our Lord's return in glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ took our existential crisis into his body, and there our own mortality and our sin died with him on the cross and was buried. Even so, his birth as God in human flesh in the manger and his glorious resurrection have ensured that God has joined with humanity forever and has offered to us everlasting life through the gospel. Therefore, when we face our own death in good times or in bad, we can stand strong with all those who have been persecuted and devoured by Satan's minions in the grave. Yet we can stand as victors because death, hell, and Satan cannot rob us of Christ. As Martin Luther wrote in his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and take they our life, goods, honor, child, and wife, let those all be gone, for they have nothing won. The kingdom ours remains. This Christmas, instead of celebrating for show, we celebrate for real as something we cannot afford to lose. Christ himself is the word who rises far above our own feelings and far above anyone's community standards. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray for the whole church of God and for all according to their needs. Especially remember those who are recovering from surgical procedures, those who are struggling through bouts of ill health, who are trying to maintain their health in whatever way they can, who are struggling with their own existential crises in life, who are dealing with chronic pain and rehabilitation, who are struggling with cancer, who are living in assisted living facilities and dealing with dementia, who are uh, dealing with both chronic issues as well as uh, acute issues, and who are trying to make good recoveries and uh, manage their, their pain levels. We ask for those who are recovering from serious health events, whether cardiac or injuries or anything else, uh, we ask that you be with uh, those who are dealing with ongoing health issues and uh, whose families are trying to struggle to find places for them to be safe and cared for. And we ask that you be with all who are in need of you, who are crying out to you to be relieved of the crosses that they bear. And we ask you if it is possible. Lord, give them that relief for which they pray. And if not, then like John the Baptist, give them the strength to face the crises in their lives and to, to uh, know that your voice will lead them through life and into eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for your divine guidance and protection for all whose lives have been uh, 
overturned for whatever reason and need to have them put back together. We ask that you especially be with our Christian brothers and sisters in the Ukraine whose government has betrayed them and uh, who, even if they cannot celebrate Christmas as they have uh, in the past, nevertheless, they can still find comfort in you, O oh Lord. We ask that you be with our military, our first responders, our medical caregivers, all those who are put in harm's way for our sake. We ask you to be with those in authority and let your Holy Spirit guide them and not that lying spirit. And we ask for all who are traveling this time of year to be kept safe through the guidance of your holy angels. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our These and all of the prayer concerns, Lord, we set them before your throne of grace, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. At this time, we'll collect the offer. What we'll do is we'll continue with the service of the sacrament. Uh, since our uh, AV has given us some technical difficulties, we'll just do the, the rest of the service without the music. Please rise as we turn to page 208 in the forepart of the hymn. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks to you for your boundless love shown to us when you set your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sins giving him into death, that we might not die eternally, because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels of all the company of heaven, we love and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabaoth, the door, heaven and earth, Full acclaim, shout the glory of your name. Sing Hosanna in the highest, sing Hosanna to the Lord. Truly blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us, and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your boundless mercy, you sent your servant, John the Baptist, to proclaim that in Christ the kingdom of heaven draws near. With thankful hearts we pray, come, Lord Jesus, confident that in his body and blood, given to eat and drink, we receive the forgiveness of sins and so proclaim his death until he comes again in glory. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the same night when she was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave him thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper. When he gave him thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you steadfastly in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. We turn to page 212 for the post-communion comment. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the peace to come 
in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee his peace. Amen.